Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Eco Tringo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag 10 december 2016. Dit is het bulletin van zaterdag. I'm a bit reluctant to say this bulletin will be in English as all weekend bulletins are. We have some Morse code today and an SSTV image in PD90. Several people sent me an image they received from the ISS yesterday and the day before. The best one was from Charles PD0RS, an image he received yesterday, so that one I will use. In addition to that we have the propagation bulletin of the RSGB and a column of Ono from Australia reflecting on his first six years as a foundation license holder in the Perth area in Western Australia. This is GB2RS, the news broadcasting service of the Radio Society of Great Britain. It comes to you from G4NJH in Nottingham. You can find the text on the RSGB's own web page. Now the radio propagation report compiled by G0KYHE3YLA and G4BAO. The past week has been reasonably settled geomagnetically with the K index generally being between 0 and 3 at the beginning of the week. The noon time, noon time critical frequency as measured by the Chiltern in Ionosond near Harwell on Tuesday was just over 6 me- MHz which meant 40 metres often struggled for contacts close in around the UK but 15 metres was potentially open to DX at times. The critical frequency climbed higher during Tuesday afternoon, which meant that 12 metres may have been open. This also confirms that noon doesn't always bring the highest critical frequencies. We then had a succession of B-class solar flares on Wednesday. A large current coronal hole moved across the Earth-facing side of the Sun and became geo-effective from December 7th. Enhanced geomagnetic activity, including minor G1 storm conditions, then occurred on Thursday when a high-speed solar wind stream passed Earth. Don't forget you can get a short pre-event enhancement just as the plasma hits and the K-index rises, but the prognosis for HF is then not good if we get a prolonged storming. Noah predicts that the coronal hole effects will diminish after the weekend, leaving a more settled ionosphere for the rest of the week. Conditions may become more unsettled again from around sun, uh, December the 19th. So Monday to Saturday next week may be the best time for working DX on the HF bands, but don't forget to check the low bands for DX during a late afternoon and through the hours of darkness, as we are at an optimum time as we near the winter solstice. Now for VHF and up, this week sees one of the biggest meteor showers of the year. The peak of the Geminids is expected on Wednesday morning, at about 0020 UTC, it's expected. I'm sorry, I'll read that again. The peak's expected on or around 0020 UTC, with a zenithal hourly rate of about 120. All the low VHF bands will be affected, with EME capa- capable stations on 70 centimetres also able to make meteor scatter QSOs. There seems to be a common theme in the weather models for the coming week, which is there's likely to be high pressure nearby to the south and east of Britain over the continent. A series of low-pressure systems will continue to pass the northwest of the country with cloud rain and periods of stronger winds. This means any tropo conditions are likely to be confined in the southern and eastern half of Britain, closer to the high pressure over the continent, which is the direction to look for any tropo DX during next week. The latter part of the week will probably see a stronger development of high pressure over the south of Britain, maintaining the tropo options into the following weekend. Low losses and high declinations this week make it a good one for EME contacts. E44QX should be QRV on the gigahertz bands from Jericho until uh, Wednesday. That's it for this week for the propagation team. Foundations of Amateur Radio The other day I celebrated my sixth birthday. No, not that one. The one that reminds me when I first became licensed as a radio amateur. It caused me to reflect on what I've done with my license and what I've learned and where I'm heading. A recurring theme in my amateur life is one of upgrading. Not a month goes by when someone makes a comment about my license status. As you might know, I hold the entry-level license in Australia, the foundation license as it's called. Other countries call theirs different things, but the aim of this license type is to introduce new entrants into the hobby, and for me, it's done that in spades. 
If you've listened to some of my previous mutterings and musings, or if you've listened to all of them, heading for 300 now, you'll have noticed that it's rare that I'm not talking about something I learned, something new or something that interests me that I've found and I want to share with the community. This quest for knowledge, learning and curiosity is something that I've always had, and I'm sure I'm not alone with those traits. It occurred to me that my newly minted amateur license achieved exactly what it intended to, introduce me to amateur radio. It did more than that. It set me on a path that I'm travelling down today, where I'm learning a new thing most weeks and telling others about it. I don't yet fully grasp the difference between an NPN and a PNP transistor, nor do I understand the workings of a valve to the point where I can explain it to you, but the truth of the matter is that I haven't had the need to, or at this stage the curiosity to. That's not to say that a day will come when I do want to know. So here's the thing. Would you rather I have the highest level of licensed, having passed my test, cramming for my exam, guessing answers on a multiple choice form, or would it be better if I came to know and understand the body of work that makes up the foundations of our hobby? As an aside, I've taken a mock test at some point. If I recall, I managed a score of 75% or so, might have been higher, but it outlined the areas of knowledge that I don't have at this time, and that was why I took it in the first place. There are amateurs who pass tests, and then there are amateurs who learn. One final comment about upgrading. When was the last time you upgraded your car license to the next level, say rally driver or Formula One driver? When was the last time you got called out on not having upgraded and admonished for being a lowly car driver? On to amateur stuff. First of all, the wheel bearing has gone to a better place. It drove away on a big blue truck on Wednesday morning and is no longer. So sad. In antenna news, you might recall my experiences with the installation and tuning of an antenna for a friend of mine. I made all manner of what some would call outlandish statements. One amateur all but called me a liar and accused me of making it all up to promote my podcast. All this excitement because I dared query the documentation of an antenna. I've reached out to the manufacturer, but I've not yet received a response. I'm told that my hunch that this was a vertical dipole was correct. That in itself is curious since I've been experimenting with a vertical dipole made from coax. Not enough to talk about success yet, but enough to be told that it'll never work. Gotta love the doubters. As I suspected, the cut-off piece of inner coax, if you recall, the one that was a centimetre or so too long, is half of a capacitor. The other half is in the base of the antenna. Note that all this is based on what I've been told by a fellow amateur, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the manufacturer what they have to say. So, my vertical antenna idea started off with the idea that I wanted to use a vertical dipole for working portable. I realised that some of the designs I've seen knocking around the net are cutting off long chunks of shield or folding it back or doing all manner of funky things to a piece of coax. I wondered what would happen if I took a piece of wire, cut it to the length of one half of a dipole, attached a banana plug to it and stuck it on the end of a piece of coax. One half of the antenna would be the wire, the other half would be the shield of the coax. If I could come up with something like a choke that would stop RF travelling all the way back to my radio, I might have myself a vertical dipole with the benefit of not having to cut up coax, no extra connectors, and if I made it possible for the choke to slide up and down, my antenna would be simple to transform into something for any band. As I said, I'm not yet at the success stage. I did some testing with something called an ugly ballon, but it's pretty clunky and results are mixed. I tried ferrite clip-on beads, but they didn't seem to do the trick though that could have been the nature of the particular clip-ons that I had at the time. When I have some more playtime free, I'll have another crack at it, since it seems promising, and if there are people selling vertical dipoles with curious matching networks at the base, there's hope for me yet. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha Bravo.
Weet ik meer, dat zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2 NOS. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf s ochtends herhaald. Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Echo Tango Echo. En denk eraan, als je gaat solderen, dat je steeds alleen de kant van de soldeerbout vastpakt waar het draadje uitkomt.